you have your Bibles, we're going to start over in 1 Kings this morning. I know that's a long way from Ephesians, but we're going to go over here just briefly and pick up an account on uh, Solomon. First Kings in chapter 3. It's, one, it's a story that uh, most of us know well. Chapter 3, and we'll pick up verse 5 and following. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. And then Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you. And you have reserved for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in, in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people, who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a, a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. Then drop down to 16 where we get to see that wisdom in action. Then two, wes two women who were harlots, came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. It happened on the third day after I gave birth that this woman also gave birth to a child, and we were together. There was no stranger within uh, with, excuse me, with us in the house, only the two of us in the house. This woman's son died in the night, because she lay on it. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son beside me uh, while your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead son in my bosom. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him carefully in the morning, behold, he was not my son whom I had borne. Then the, the other woman said, No, for the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. But the first woman said, No, for the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. And then the king said, the one, the one says, This is my son who is living. And, is, and your son is the dead one. The other says, No, for your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. The king said, Get me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose child was the living one spoke to the king, for she wept deeply, she wept deeply, stirred over her son, and said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, He shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king said, Give the, the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Now flip back over to our Ephesians text is where we're headed. Here in this, this text, Solomon 
uh, we're, we're, we're told here Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived and he was made so by God himself because he asked for that to rule over Israel he didn't ask for any selfish things he asked for that and as, as we've read this story about the two women and uh, their son Solomon faced in that scenario uh, a very very difficult challenge or test of the wisdom God uh, had given him and we see that he was uh, exceptionally wise because who would have thought to do that very thing to take and say give me a sword and uh, let's just cut the, the, the child in half and give half to the one and half to the other but the result of it was is that all Israel uh, they, they recognized in Solomon the wisdom of God was in him that he had God's wisdom. Now I'm not preaching on that at all. I'm just, I'm just looking at that because God's wisdom was on display there. And we're going to look at God's wisdom in our text today. Because as difficult as that problem was with the, the women, with the, the one dead child and the one live uh, son, as difficult as that problem was, and, and Solomon made it look rather easy uh, in his wisdom that God had given him to resolve that problem, the, there, there's a greater problem. There was a greater problem uh, that God faced. And that was, in, as we've been looking at in Ephesians, that, that, that was really, uh, uh, that His wisdom is made manifest in a way that, that, that was part of the eternal plan of God we find today. And that is, is the joining of Jews and Gentiles into one body in perfect unity. That was the wisdom of God. We find that in our text this, the, the, today. And we'll get to that in a moment. In Ephesians chapter 2, pertaining to this discussion, we learned that as Gentiles, the Gentiles, last time we were in this text together before Resurrection Sunday, we learned this about the Gentiles. Us, if you will. Those who are not part of the Jewish uh, commonwealth. The, the nation of Israel, the Jew themselves, Israel. The Gentile, we found, is separate from Christ. He has no part in Christ. He's apart from Christ. He's excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. He's a stranger to the covenants of promise. All of the unconditional covenants of God that were made to, with the people of Israel above all other nations. And we looked at a psalm that said he, he has treated no other nation this way. There's only Israel has these promises. They were strangers to the covenants, and that put them without hope and without God. That's who the Gentiles are apart from Jesus Christ. That's who we were. That's who we were. And we were reminded of that so that we would deal with a prejudice and a uh, uh, discrimination that was inherent within the Gentile community toward the Jew and even toward the Jew toward the Gentile. There's a, there is a hatred that runs truly deep. And it is significant because God says that in the joining of the two is part of the eternal purpose in displaying His wisdom to the angels. That's what we learn in today's text. See, we were totally alienated, the Gentiles. We were totally, totally alienated from God. And He made peace between the Jew and the Gentile by the cross of Christ. He tears down every barrier that separates man. He could tear it down. He destroys those barriers that separate us. And He makes us fellow citizens, the Gentiles, fellow citizens of the household of God. And it's all through the blood of Christ. And we say, praise God. Praise God. That's what we have in Him. And that, as I stated, is the, 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 the wisdom of God. Let's read our text for today. 1 through 13 of chapter 3. For this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have learnt, excuse me, heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, 
By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations has not, excuse me, was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of His power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in, in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. What we learn in that extended passage is this. As the church, as the church, that is those made up of Jews and Gentiles, the church made up of Jews and Gentiles, we are the revelation of the wisdom of God unto the angels. Let me say it again. As the church made up of Jews and Gentiles, we are the revelation of the wisdom of God unto the angels. See, the church has been established... If you want to know why we're here, why, why, what is the big plan, what's the big picture? Because, listen, we, we often get so caught up in the little picture, we don't understand God's got a big picture. He's got a lot going. And there's a lot uh, more than just us getting saved. It's all for even a greater purpose. And part of that eternal plan, the establishment of, of His church, was for the purpose of showing forth His wisdom to the angelic realm, the rulers and the powers, the angels, so they could see the wisdom of God. See, we, we, we look at this and we pass over this because this is the kind of stuff we're like, oh, it doesn't really pertain to me. Listen, it's all about us. It's all about what God has done in us to bring us together and, and to be able to tear down barriers where I can look at whatever skin color, whatever people group, and call them my brother. And call them my sister. And we're tied together in a perfect unity in Jesus Christ. And that's the wisdom of God. It is no small thing. This animosity has run throughout the pages of Scripture. Read the story. Read His story. And see how the Jews and the Gentiles have warred. And they still do to this day. But yet in the church, there's something different. There's supposed to be something very different. And that's what we see here. In this passage, there are three points. Three points we want to consider regarding this mystery, as Paul calls it. Uh, this mystery as this truth of, of, of what we're looking at, the establishment of the church for the purpose of revealing God's wisdom is brought home here. So we're going to look at this. Now I want to say this right out of the gate. This is a really tough text uh, to break down homiletically. And what I mean is when a guy prepares a sermon, that's hom homiletics. When, when you're doing your study and you want to break this text down, some texts, you know, it's point one, two, three, and it just lays right out. And Paul's great for that, by the way. He's such a teacher that it's real easy once you get the truth of what he's saying, usually it just, it, you know, it unfolds. But, but in this text, it's kind of difficult because what we have here is it, it's, a, it's parenthet, uh, parenthetical. Parenthetical. And what I mean by that is uh, it includes a lot of commentary 
uh, on Paul himself. He talks about himself as well as the, the further instruction on the, the previous text of 2, 11, and 12. That's what we're, we're drawing out of this. Uh, the, the Jew Gentile being made one in, in one body. But, but it, it, it's, it, there, there's a parentheses here and, and I'll, I'll get to that. I'm going to explain this just briefly. Uh, the backdrop, a little backdrop here a couple points, three or so, that I want us to get. First, this is uh, th this text is difficult because of this parenthetical issue. And what I mean by that is verse 2 through 13 is uh, it's parenthetical to what Paul started to do in verse 1. If you look at verse 1, Paul stated, or excuse me, he started to offer a prayer for these believers. He started to, to pray for them in light of what he had just set forth in the prior text of 11 through 22. He was going to offer prayer. Yet he breaks it off and he doesn't resume the prayer until verse 14 and he repeats the same clause or phrase for this reason. So he started for, for this reason and then he breaks into, like Paul does, he'll do this and he'll take off. And he'll say a lot. And then he'll pick back up with what he's doing. And that's what we have as he's writing here. He started to write a prayer or share the prayer. And then he, he breaks off and he goes into this. And we come back to it in 14 with for this reason. So as Paul uh, does this, uh, he interjects here uh, an extended uh, material that is relevant to the subject at hand. It, it's all relevant. To what, he, what he's just said. He was going to pray and he's like, wait, I want to say this. And he, and he takes off. Second point here. It, the personal commentary that I mentioned. Paul throughout this parenthesis, he, he, he deals with his personal uh, situation. Where he's at, what's going on, uh, not in specifics, but, but, but he says stuff about where he's at. But he sets down on his stewardship, his entrustment. Of the handling of this mystery. Okay, he's going to talk about that. Now, some feel in light of this personal information that he covers is that Paul, uh, his apostleship was being challenged. And they give a lot of reasons, but the main one that uh, surfaces if they, from those who take this position, uh, they say because he's in prison, people were questioning, and that's why he kind of, he talks about his stewardship of this mystery, and, and why he can teach this and, and, and bring this home. Another take is that Paul is establishing his authority while even in, in prison, so that he can teach and reveal the truth concerning this controversial issue of Jews and Gentiles coming together. Now I want to say something. The Jerusalem Council has been years, years prior to this. Ephesus. I mean, we're, we're, we're prior to the writing of, of this letter. Uh, but, but the issues are still the same. They're still relevant to the Jew-Gentile world. The, 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 the marrying of these two people groups is, 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 as I said earlier, no small matter. It's a huge thing. It's, it's huge. And, and all I would say is, is all you have to look is, even within our uh, secular world, uh, our society, at how oftentimes bridging races, quote races, there's only one race, the human race, but skin colors, people of various ethnicity, bringing them together. And how difficult at times that is. Well, understand this struggle that's been ancient. This, is, this has been part of the, the, the fall. Uh, it, it's rooted in all of it. And, and, and so this is not a small thing that, that Paul's doing here. So he's establishing his authority to teach this to the Ephesus church. They say that's why he interjects all of this. As to his imprisonment, there may have been uh, some who had some concern as to uh, his imprisonment, but not necessarily as it, as it 
pertained to his apostleship. They might have been concerned, because we see that surfaces that they, they did have concern for him being in prison. So that, that's just some backdrop. Now let's get into these uh, points that, that drive home this, this truth. That how the revelation or, or the, the, this mystery, the Jew-Gentile being one, is the revelation. The church is the revelation of the wisdom of God uh, unto the, the angelic world. First, first point, the revealer of the mystery. And I'm not going to read the whole text again. This is verses 1 through 9. The revealer of the mystery. Uh, you could sit down on this, but this is the part... These verses here, we pick up a lot of information, a lot of information here on Paul. On Paul. And just how he came to be the keeper and the revealer of this sacred trust. And as I moved through this, I found a lot of personal challenge here. I think all of us should. When you look at Paul, and whenever Paul gets personal, and you get a look at Paul, and you get to start seeing Paul's heart, I'm telling you, if it doesn't challenge you, uh, you, you must be made out of stone. Because his heart, to me, Paul is, is uh, they were all special. But Paul was special <laughs> to me. Because Paul never, ever got over the grace of God in his own life. He never did. He, and it didn't matter how long he, he walked with the Lord he, he, never, he never got past that. He never got past how God reached into His world and took this man who was persecuting His people and saved him. And not only saved him, but gave him a sacred entrustment and said, you're going to be my apostle. I mean, it's, it's a mind blower. And Paul never got over that. He just never, ever got over that. And so we, we see him here. He sets forth this information about himself as the revealer of this sacred, this sacred trust. And there's a challenge to us because his heart, we've all been touched by that grace. And I'm telling you, you don't, you, if you get in a place where you forget that, you need to go back and do the things you do, did at first. And I'm, the, I'm one of those people who have to do that repeatedly. I'll be honest with you, I can pull out of my Bible here the very track God used to turn my life around, the backslidden heart. I carry it with me. Because it reminds me of that moment of God's grace in my life when He put me on my face and He, and he put me on a, a, on a path of purpose for Him and, and, and saved me and, and, and made me right with Him. And that's, that's what we need to be reminded of because it keeps us fresh. It keeps us in love with Him. It keeps us going. It keeps us from becoming stagnant. And that's why He told that this church who had lost their first love in Revelation, he said, what? If you want to get it back, what do you do? you got to go back and do what you did at first. Go back to those early things. Embrace that anew. Experience it fresh. Because it is fresh every day when you look in the mirror and you realize I'm a sinner even yet. And I walk every moment by the grace of God. It's, it's just a powerful thing. But let's look at him here. Just Let's look at Paul, what he says about himself. First, he identifies himself uh, here in 3.1. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. This, this is the second time... This is the second time that he has identified himself. The first was in chapter 1 and verse 1. And, and then here. And th in this description, it's different. It's not the same as in, in 1 1. What we have here in 1 1, he said, an apostle of Christ Jesus. One sent with authority of Christ Jesus. And here he says, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles, of you Gentiles. Now, a couple things here. A, he's the prisoner, he says, of Jesus. This is significant. And it's very challenging when you think about it. Why is that? Well, remember Paul's circumstances when he writes this letter. Where is he? He's in prison. He's in prison. He, he, he's, he's in prison. And he tells us, it tells us when we look at this, 
when you look at what he says about his circumstances and where he's at, it tells us how Paul was able to cope with his circumstances. We learn this in Philippians. He writes extensively about that. Your sinner has to be Jesus. And everything that happens to you has to come back to the, the purpose of my sinner. What does Jesus have in this? And that's how he looked at things. He didn't see himself as a prisoner of Rome. He saw himself as what? A prisoner of Jesus Christ. That's, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's, who, that's who's the master of my soul. That's, who, that's who's got the chains on my heart. That's who, that's who I, I, I am uh, subject to. He saw his circumstances as a direct result of being in bondage to Jesus Christ. Willing bondage, by the way. He didn't, it wasn't an ugly thing. This isn't a bad thing he's talking about. He's saying, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He's been in prison right at five years, approximately, at this point. Two years in Caesarea and three in Rome. And, and the charges that landed him in this particular imprisonment here uh, was the charges that were made by the Jews, by the Jews. Now listen, this is great because we're talking about this Jew-Gentile thing. They were made by the Jews that Paul had brought Trophimus, who? A Gentile, into the temple. In Acts chapter 21, 27 through 28, he brought him into the temple. They brought the charge. Now, he's been arrested. He was arrested uh, and, and, and on Jewish charges, and he's imprisoned by Roman authority. Yet, he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm a prisoner of of Christ Jesus. How? How does he do that? Because he viewed everything that came to him, whether blessing or hardship, as in the control of the one he served. The one that he was, uh, was a servant of. And that was Christ himself. That, that's how he viewed things. Now, that's the key to, to, to the assertion I'm a prisoner of Christ. That, that understanding. The question you have to ask yourself and what I ask myself by way of application, how do I view my circumstances? Because more often than not, we get on the woe is me kick. <laughs> and instead of saying, okay, Lord, you've got me here. Because <laughs> you're the Lord of my life. You're the one who, who's in charge of my circumstances. What do, you, what, do, what, do, what do I do with this? What do you want? And, and that's how Paul went through life. That's how he viewed his ministry. That's how he viewed the circumstances he found himself in at any given moment. B, on, under the same point here. He says, for the sake of you Gentiles. This has a direct application and a general overall encompassing application. He said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. The, the direct application would be the situation with Trophimus. I'm in prison because I stood with the Gentile and took him in the, the, the temple. And then the other one would be the general, and that is, is the over-encompassing commission of Paul. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. That's uniquely Paul's position. Peter went to the Jews, and Paul was the, the Gentiles. God brought Paul forward to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Two here. A bit of info on, on the revealer here. He says the keeping of the mystery was a stewardship. It was a stewardship. What does that mean? It refers Stewardship refers to the management of a household in the cultural context of, of, of the day. Uh, the management of a household or a business on behalf of someone else. So what was the stewardship? It was a sacred trust. The, this, this, this mystery was given him as a sacred trust. Now, the point is this. The mystery was given to Paul to Paul by the grace of God to be kept and revealed by Him. He was supposed to take this out here and reveal the mystery. Every one of us, and, and, and when I look at it by way of application, because you can look at this and say, that was Paul's ministry. That's Paul's deal. But what's yours? What's mine? 
Because every one of us, when we were saved, we were given a sacred trust. Maybe not a direct commissioning on, in the same, on the same plane as the apostles. They were unique to time. They were the foundational elements uh, upon the, uh, which the church was built and went forward. Uh, Christ being the chief cornerstone. He was the foundation stone. But the reality is they were unique. But I'm going to tell you something. You are too. We all have been given stewardships. You say, well, I don't know what stewardships. Well, we've talked about some. You've been given spiritual gifts, every one of us. Some of you have ministries. They're sacred entrustments. That's how you should view these things. These opportunities. The talents God has given you. If you're talented... Who do you want to be talented for? And I challenge every one of you who have talent, whether singing or instrumentally, musically, whether it be teaching, whatever, that God, well, teaching is a spiritual gift, but any talent you have, let me ask you, who do you want to be talented for? The world or for the Lord? I want to be talented for the Lord. I want, I want to use my... And you can use them not out, outside of the walls of the church and still be for the Lord. But what I'm saying is, is, are you using them for the Lord? Are you using them in the church context? Or do they have to pull teeth? Or do people have to pull teeth to get you to let, let, it, let it out for the Lord? See, that's how we should look at things. This was a stewardship. It's a sacred entrustment. And Paul understood these things. It's what made Paul, Paul. He saw them for what they were. And we, we, need to, we need to bridge that over by way of application and start looking at things that way. Whether it be our circumstances we find ourselves in and, and being able to give that back to the Lord or the stewardships that He's entrusted to me. Am I going to use this? That's what he saw the mystery. And it was, by the way, it was a sacred entrustment to Paul. There's no question about it, this mystery. And the one we're talking about, about the Jew and the Gentile. The inclusion of the Gentiles being brought in, but it's more than that. It's being made one. It's being made one. So everything we have as individuals, it belongs to God in the first place. Paul saw what he was, uh, was invested in him as being given him of God as a sacred entrustment. He recognized this and, and it gave him his authority to utilize his abilities, and to bring this teaching forward because he knew it was given him from God. Three, the mystery was received by revelation. It, we're told here in, in verse uh, 3 through 5, it was received by revelation. God revealed the mystery to Paul. This mystery, which wasn't known in the past, was revealed to the apostles and the prophets. And mystery in the, in the New Testament, that's exact. It's not like a, a, a Sherlock Holmes mystery or a whodunit type mystery thing. That we think of mystery that way in our mind, in our culture. But in, new, in biblical understanding, a mystery was that which was once hid that has now been made known. It's been revealed. And so it was revealed here, this mystery, which wasn't known, has been revealed to the apostles and the prophets. Paul included in this, as, as a, the apostle born out of due season, the least of the apostles, he was called to bear it and to instruct on it. And we see in verse 9, and to bring it to light what is the ministration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Paul's purpose was to tell the church how this is supposed to work and what it's supposed to look like and what it means. And we're learning it here through his pen under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But Paul's purpose was he walked the earth and he planted these churches was to teach this, was to bring this forward. How, how all races... All ethnic groups, but specifically they all fall into that parameter, Jew or Gentile, how they can be brought together into a perfect unity in Jesus Christ by His grace. And so he teaches that. That's his deal. It's teaching he received from God directly. And that becomes, his again, his authority to, to bring it forward. Four, Paul viewed his service as a gift 
Look at 7 and 8 there. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of His power to me, the very least of all saints. This grace was given, gift given, given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. He viewed His service, His service, uh, His commissioning as a gift from God. Is that cool? Don't you wish every time God opened a door of opportunity that we as believers would respond the same way? That God's given me a gift? It's a gift. It's a gift to be able to walk in to a Sunday school room where God's people have recognized that you've got an ability to teach and to walk into a room with little bitty kids, little bigger kids, a little bigger yet, a little bigger. Young adults, adults, right on down the line. It's a gift. It's a precious gift to be able to be used of God to proclaim the unfathomable riches of Christ to a mind, to an individual, to impact that person's life for God, for eternity. That they can go out and, 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 and impact another person. And it's a direct result of what you put in them. And then that person goes and infects another person. You see how it works? But you've but you got to see it right. When it's a burden, it becomes an ugly thing. When it's a gift, it's a precious thing. And a gift can become a burden. <laughs> It can. It can be hard. It doesn't necessarily mean it's easy. Look at Paul. All you got to do is go read uh, 2 Corinthians 11 and you find out how hard it was on Paul. It wasn't easy, but he viewed it as a gift. Because when you weigh it in the balance, to be, to be called of God and placed in a place where you can be used for His glory, for eternity, it far outweighs any suffering. For I consider that the sufferings of this world are not to be compared to what? The glory to be revealed to us. Romans tells us. They, they can't even compare. And Paul saw it as a gift. A gift by grace. And he was empowered by God. That's how we ought to, ought to look at it. And then... You moving on here, the kind of this this kind of attitude when you have this, I will I will say this and, and, and I, I add this in myself because I was thinking about it. If just a few of us had this kind of an attitude, it, it becomes contagious. It does. It, it, it causes you to look at yourself. I, I, I walk in the, the Sunday school room. Gina started teaching. I don't know if you know, knew that, but Gina's been teaching a Sunday school class. And I'm not saying our Sunday school teachers are falling on their faces or anything, but you walked in her, when she took over that Sunday school room, I walked past her and she's got that little classroom just, you know, it's just like sparkling. <laughs> it's sparkling. Like a, you walk in there and the kids are looking for something new every time. And all of us have been there. Where Gina was. But when somebody comes in with a freshness that, and they're, they're looking at it that this is something that, that I've been allowed to do that I want to give myself to, it, it, it causes you to look again and, and, and measure, okay, maybe I, maybe I could step up more. You know, maybe I need to step up my game. Not in a negative way because it's not a competition. But it, it, it just, it has a way of, of, of causing us challenging us and that's what I was saying about Paul you look at what he's talking about himself here and it's a mind blower how it challenges us to a higher plane in our walk with the Lord when you see somebody as sold out as Paul any individual it, it just it takes us to a different place but anyway he was a prisoner when you look at Paul here and the personal information he, he gives here what right did he have to bring such a teaching as this union between the Gentiles and the Jew and there being one body this mystery what right did he have well he just set it forth he was a prisoner commissioned a, a commissioned steward and keeper and revealer of the mystery which was once hidden and is now made known and and required of his church. And Paul was supposed to teach that. And he knew that. 
He understood his calling and he embraced it. Second point to consider here uh, regarding uh, the, 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 this truth uh, of the union of the two, the Gentile and the Jew into one body as a re re uh, revelation of God's wisdom and that's the mystery itself. Contrary, and I'm, I want to say this, contrary to the thinking of many, the mystery, the mystery is not the truth of Gentile salvation. Because I've heard it preached, and, I don't, and that's not way of field, by the way. I'm not saying you're way of field if you've ever taught that. I probably even said it over the years. I probably said the mystery is Gentile inclusion. But that, that's not specifically the mystery. The mystery is, is not the truth of Gentile salvation and it's not even the, the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that is unique to this dispensation of this mystery being made known, being lived out, being realized. It's neither one of those things. The mystery is, look at verse 6, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's the mystery. That's the mystery. That's the revelation of the wisdom of God. That's what he said right here. He says that. This is what reveals that, that wisdom of God. The, the mystery is the Gentile and, and the Jew in unity, in one new man and one body. That's a mystery. That is the mystery. But it's not a mystery because it's realized every time it happens in the body. When a, when a Gentile gets saved or a Jew and we're all in here and how are we different churches? No, we're one church. One body. It's the bringing of these two hostile groups into unity and the Gentile becoming what he says fellow heirs we've already looked at this last time that's why I'm not sitting down on this fellow heirs that means a boundless inheritance from from those once ex for excuse me for those once excluded it means we're fellow members of the body uh, that that we learned in, in uh, 11 through 22, we were strangers before. Now we're citizens and equals. That's what it means, fellow members. We're fellow partakers of the promise. We actually, although the, the unconditional covenants are, are specific to Israel as a people. They were made to the people of Israel. That's why I don't believe in, in covenant theology where the, the church is Israel. We are not Israel. We are the church. But the beauty is, is in Christ, we have been made partakers of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the, the, the uh, Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. All of those. But, but the land and the new covenant really speak to the people of Israel. But because of their blessing and the realization of it, we're blessed in that. But we share in all this because we have come through Christ. We've been made one. We come into this through the entity of the church. That's who we are. This is what was once hidden, of which Paul was the keeper and the revealer, and this is the wisdom of God. This brings us to the final point here, and that's the goal of the mystery that's worked out here. The goal. Look at 10 and 11. So that, there it is, so that, this is the purpose, so that the manifold wisdom, all of what he just said, is so that the manifold wis wisdom of God might now be made known through what? The church to the rulers and the authorities, the angels, in the heavenly places. That's the purpose of the mystery. Is it reveals the wisdom of God. We saw the wisdom of God in Solomon. I'm telling you, who thinks to take a sword and cut the two in half? I mean the one in half to reveal who the real mother was. 
Who, I mean, in, 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 in the way the text reads, it, it wasn't hard. It was just like he thought, give me a sword. And the mother, no way. Who thinks to send his unique and only begotten son? Who thinks to do that? To become flesh. To condescend from His glory and literally in humility embrace servanthood and, his, and that which He created take on flesh so that He can go to the cross of Calvary and shed His blood. What is that? You want to know what it is? That's the wisdom of God. So it's not a small thing. This isn't over your head. This isn't over anybody's head. This should be what we glory in. That we can sit and we can, we can have brothers in Zambia, Africa. We can have them in Brazil. We can have them in Spain. We can have them in Canada. We can have them in Australia. And we're all equally brothers. And it doesn't, have, doesn't mean anything skin tone. It doesn't mean Jew, Jew. That's meaningless in the wisdom of God through the cross of Christ. That's God's wisdom. And that's what we see. That's powerful. It's awesome. And he goes on and he tells us what it means, gives us a couple results, or, or I, I just, they're, 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 they give, and I'm not saying it's, uh, I don't like to pass over it, I guess, in 10 and 11, but additional thoughts in light of this. He says, in whom, because he, he talked about in Christ Jesus our Lord, and he says, and, and by the way, in Him, in Him, we, meaning who? The church. The church. Who's the church? Jews and Gentiles in perfect unity, one body, in whom we have boldness, boldness and confident access through faith in Him. Access where? You want to know where? The Holy of Holies. The very throne of God into the very family of God. We, we have boldness, not just brashness, but boldness and confidence together. What's that? We don't have to be afraid. We were aliens and strangers and foreigners and all of these things without God, without hope. But because of the Christ, we can come with boldness and confidence in the church as his children, right to the very throne. Therefore, he goes on and he says, listen, he says to these believers, therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulation. This is where they were concerned about his imprisonment that I referred to earlier. On your behalf, for they are your glory. What does he mean by that? Well, I'm going to tell you what he's saying right there. Basically what he's saying, don't get shook up, it's all part of the program. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm in prison right now, but don't, don't, don't get all shook up about that. It's God's plan. And it's for your glory that I'm here. So, so it's awesome what God has done. I came across this J. Vernon McGee, and I'm, I'm, I'm loving him here lately. I'm in, I, I love J. Vernon McGee. All, all of a sudden, I've been reading his stuff. And I've, I've listened to him forever. When I first turned around, I'd listen to him all the time on the radio because I got a big kick out of him. And, and I, I've been reading his little uh, commentaries, which are basically his messages. But he, he, he put it this way, and, and it's nothing. He just kind of boiled it down throughout history. And, and, and he made this point, and I thought it was good. He said there's been a threefold division in the human race. A threefold division in the human race. All people were Gentiles from Adam to Abraham. 2,000 years. All people were Gentiles from Adam to Abraham. Then he said all people were either Jews or Gentiles from Abraham to Christ. 2,000 years. And then he says now you have either Jews, Gentiles, or the church that is both Jew and Gentile. From Pentecost to the rapture, another 2,000 plus years. Is that cool? But what, what, what once existed in complete animosity toward each other has been brought together because of the cross of Calvary. That, 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 is, that is the mystery and the wisdom of God. 
It reveals his wisdom. You do. We do as a church. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for your precious word today and this study in the book of Ephesians, Lord. It's just a, such a blessing personally, and I pray it is for this, this church family here, Lord, that we would grow and we'd understand who we are in you and, and your purpose for us as a church. And I pray that we'd embrace that. And I pray, too, as we were challenged personally from Paul's uh, own uh, testimony inserted here, uh, that, that we'd embrace... Uh, the work, and the individual opportunities that you, you've blessed us with, with the same heart of, of Paul, with a humility and an understanding that it's a gift to be even asked to serve you, Lord. And that we'd give ourselves fully to those, those tasks, Lord, and uh, that, that we'd seek to see you glorified. But I thank you, Lord, that we exist as one new man, uh, in the church and I pray as we've already discussed that racism and discrimination would have no place in your body and, and I'm praying specifically for ours that it, it really flies in the face of your purpose and your wisdom Lord and, and I pray that we could see that clearly and that we could deal with such attitudes if they exist in, in us as individuals but especially as a church Lord help us to truly reveal the blessedness, uh, how blessed you are, uh, that you are an awesome God and worthy of complete uh, worship on, on our parts, Lord. Bless each one this day for being out. I, I pray that you bless uh, the day ahead. Ladies, as they travel home, I pray for the teen club meeting later this afternoon. Uh, may you uh, bless the leaders and help us to uh, have an impact upon these young lives and we thank you for them as well but just bless our day and, and any fellowship we might enjoy one with another and we ask it in Jesus name Amen <laughs>